Hey, I'm Kyle, and thanks for checking out this message today. We are glad you're here, and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is you can text River Connect one word to 97,000. And you can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and the upcoming events that we have going on. And lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text that amount to 84321, or again, you can check our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. We just want to say thanks for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Good evening, everybody. So good to see you all. My name is Patrick Bicknell. I am the student director here at the River Church, which means I oversee our 6th to 12th grade student ministry here at the church, help them to grow in their walk with the Lord, to build community with one another. And I have to say, I am actually so excited to be able to preach to you guys tonight because I have been asking Justin, Pastor Justin, for the longest time, I'm like, hey, if you ever have an opening, please let me come to Tuesday night and preach. And thankfully, this past week, he came to me and said, hey, you want to you wanna preach Tuesday night? And I was like, absolutely. So I am so excited to be able to be here with you all uh, because, honestly, I want to I share my story with you tonight a little bit because... Most of you don't know who I am. I want to share a, a little bit of who I am. Uh, and part of my story comes through Tuesday night. Uh, and the Lord, the Lord really used this ministry in my life in such a powerful way when I, was, when I was 18 years old. But just to start off about a little bit about who I am and where I started at. When I was a baby and I was really, really young, my parents brought me to church. We were a family that went to church. Like I think right when I was out of the hospital that first Sunday, I was in the nursery. I was there at Awana. I was there for kids ministry. I was there sometimes for youth ministry with Pastor Jason. Uh, but I grew up at the church. My dad believed, you know, he wanted us to have, you know, follow the Lord and be Christians and all this stuff. And at a young age, I remember professing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I remember feeling that that what He did for me was so real. I needed to follow Him. And what happened was when I was at that young age, I started to grow up, I started even feeling a call to ministry. Like I think it was in like the eighth grade, I started feeling like maybe the Lord is calling me to full-time ministry, whatever that looks like. I don't know what it might be, but I think God was calling me to, to work for him in that way. And what happened, like so many of us and so many of the people that I knew, as I started to get older, I started to fall away from the Lord. I started to follow my own sin. And what happened was when I got into high school, I started trying to fit in with the crowd. I wanted to, I wanted to do things that I knew I shouldn't. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. A lot of my friends were older in high school. So as a freshman, I was like, I, I got to do what they want to do so I, can, so I can hang out with them, right? And so as a freshman, I started going to parties with them. And there has been a couple fork in the road moments for me in my life. And when I was a freshman, I remember this, this first fork in the road moment. I remember going to my first party with them and, and we were smoking pot and it was the first time I was high. And I remember looking in the mirror at myself and saying, what are you doing? You know better. You know what you're supposed to do. You know you're supposed to be following God. You know what Jesus did for you. What are you doing? And it was that fork in the road of, of I can stop what I'm doing and I can start to follow the Lord. I can do what he wants me to do. Or I can go down this path of, of continuing to do my own sins, of continuing to do what I want to do. And so what I did in that moment is I, I went down the wrong path. I continued going down the path that I wanted to go down. And so I started doing this more and more, started partying more, started drinking more, started smoking more. And where my life ended up going was I even started getting into relationships with women, doing things that I shouldn't have at a too young of an age. And when I was 17 years old, my girlfriend at the time, she got pregnant. And we had our first son, or we had our only son, right, when I was, when I was a junior in high school, my first son. And that was another fork in the road moment for me, where life gets real at that point. And if any parents in here, right, you have a kid, life gets real when you see that little baby, and especially when I was 17 years old, you're not, you're not a little boy no more. You got to be a man. You got to provide for another human being. It was that fork in the road of, of I, can, I can start to follow the Lord now. I can start to get my life back on track. I, I might have been doing some things I shouldn't have, but I, I could start following him now. Or I continue down the path I've been going down. I continue to go down the path to, to numb the pain, to, to get away from the stress. And that's what I decided to do. 
Anytime I wasn't with my son, anytime I wasn't with him, I needed to do something just to get my mind off of all the stress that was going on in my life at that time. I had to do whatever I could because because at that point I felt like such a disappointment, felt like I had ruined my life, I had no idea what I was gonna do, so I just needed to get my mind off of it. Whether it was drinking or smoking, I needed to do whatever I could to get out of, of what I was feeling in life. And about a year later, right after I had turned 18, I remember a night so vividly. I remember sitting in my room and just feeling so hopeless, feeling embarrassed, feeling like I had ruined my life so much. And I remember praying to God and saying, I don't even deserve your forgiveness. I knew what was right. I knew what I should have been doing and I decided to go another way. I decided to follow my flesh, what I wanted to do, and I, and I made a wreck of my life. But I said, God, please forgive me. Lord, I know I don't deserve it, but I, but I need that forgiveness. And I remember going to my dad and telling him, I think I need to get back into church. I, I gotta do something. And I remember my dad brought me, not to a Sunday morning, not to youth group. He brought me to Tuesday night. He brought me here. And I remember sitting in this section over there, here in Chain Breaker for the first time, right? When everybody was testifying, go, whoa! I remember being like, ooh, what's going on here? I kind of like this, right? And I, every now and then I would give a nice little woo, but I was a little embarrassed. Didn't want me to hear too loud, right? But I remember coming here and the Lord just, just used this ministry in a way in my life to where I didn't have to feel hopeless no more. I didn't have to feel like there was, there was no light at the end of the tunnel for me. And then from there, the Lord just continued to move my life. And I had the opportunity to work on staff here at, on our operations team. And I remember setting up Tuesday night meals, coming here Tuesday mornings and then cleaning it up afterwards. And I was so excited to be able to do that because it wasn't about cleaning the tables, which was a lot to clean up, right? You're sweeping the floor, mopping. It wasn't about that. It was about seeing God do something amazing with the people here. It was about seeing God breaking chains of sin. And it was so awesome. And the Lord continued to move. And this is how I got here today. And I share that because, one, I, I love this ministry. I love that, that we here at the River Church are being what Jesus has called us to be. To go to those who are hurting, who are struggling to preach the good news. And what I love about people that come here is that they're honest with themselves. Like, we're not the people here that put on masks and say, oh, we're perfect, we don't need help. Because everybody in the world needs help. And people that come here, we go, yes, I need it. And I know the only way that I can get that help, that I can have redemption in my life, is through Jesus Christ. And secondly, I share that story because my story fits perfectly with the passages of scripture we're going to look at tonight. And every single person's story in this room fits perfectly with the passages of scripture that we are going to be looking at tonight. What we're going to be looking at here is the great contrast between what our identity is apart from the Lord and what our identity is with the Lord. It's the great contrast between being dead and being alive, from hell to heaven, from great valley to great height, to, from bondage to freedom. And we're gonna jump into Ephesians chapter two, but before we do that, I wanna pray for us real quick and just pray that the Holy Spirit would move in all of our lives tonight. So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for who you are, for the work that you're doing here, And Lord, I pray that tonight that as I speak, that it wouldn't be my words. It wouldn't be what I want to say, but it would be what you want us all to hear. I pray that you would make us open and receptive to your word and that it would penetrate our hearts and lead us to worship you and to bow down and surrender to you. We love you. We pray this all in the very precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Ephesians chapter two. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and head over to Ephesians chapter two. It'll also be on the screen. But we're gonna be starting in verse one. It says this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So as we look at this passage of scripture, what we're going to see is the first few verses tell us what all of our identities start off as. What these first few verses tell us is the condition of what every single person in this room finds themselves in when they're born. And it's the condition of fallen men. It's that we are dead. This is the place we start off as. All of us, doesn't matter where you came from, what city you were born in, how much money your parents had, doesn't matter what it is, we all start dead in our trespasses and sins. And I started thinking about a way to explain this because we can read this in the Bible and I don't know, about, don't know about you, but many times I read some stuff and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Wait, wait, what's that actually saying? And so I think it's important sometimes to explain it. And so a way that I thought about it and another, another thing about me is, is I just love sports. Love football, basketball, baseball, and I am a huge Michigan fan. And I started thinking about our fandom and the teams that we're fans of. Because 99% of the time, if you like a certain team, you're born into it. Whatever your parents like, that's what you're born into. And for some of us, we are blessed to have parents, to have someone who loves Michigan. We're born to the Michigan fandom. Some of us, sadly, are cursed into being Michigan State fans. And hey, thankfully, you're here tonight and the gospel can still save you, right? Jesus still loves you. And for some of us, we have the ultimate curse, which is being Lions fans, right? Listen, listen, I still got some hope for this year, but this Sunday was the perfect example, right? They're always gonna let us down. But 99% of the time, we are born into our fandom. And this is the same thing. This is the same sort of thing that the scripture is telling us. It's telling us what all of us are born as. How we all start off as. And there's other places in scripture that tell us that from birth we are identified with a fallen spirit. Psalms 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Look at some of those descriptions. Brought forth in iniquity, conceived in sin, death spread to all men. These verses make it clear that we are dead dead, just as those first few verses in Ephesians chapter 2 say. And if you don't agree with the Bible and what it says, I think the perfect example is found in little kids, right? You ever been around little kids? Like, I, I love my son to death, but I didn't have to send him to sin camp for him to learn how to sin. I remember that first time, right? I said, don't eat a cookie for before dinner. And what I hear, he's going to the pantry, the bag's opening up. He comes back and there's crumbs over his face. And I say, Isaac, did you eat the cookie? Nope. Right? I didn't have to teach him to do that. It's because we all have that sinful nature. And the thing is, we, we are not sinners because we sinned, but we sin because we are sinners. We sin because we have this fallen nature because we start off in this place that due to our sin, we are corrupted by it. But what does it mean to be dead in the senses of these verses? Right? Because obviously we're all living in here, right? We're not walking corpses. We're not zombies. 
I'm speaking and you guys are listening, right? We, we all got here. But however, in the areas that matter most, such as the soul, the heart, the mind, our emotions, our will, we are dead in these senses. And a great way I heard it explained was one commentator said, when death is spoke about in the spiritual sense, it means we are blinded to the reality and the glory of Christ. We are blinded to his demands. We are blinded to following him spiritually. We cannot do these things because we are fallen. Every area of our lives is corrupted by the disease of death and sin. Now, I wanted to stop right there because I think it's important that at this point in the message, it's important to clarify a couple of things. Because even though the Bible does call us corrupted by our sin, that by our very nature, we are children of wrath. That doesn't mean a couple of things. It doesn't mean first that we are as depraved or as bad as we possibly could be. Right? It doesn't mean we are as bad as all of us possibly could be. And secondly, it doesn't forget the fact that every single human, every single person sitting in here, every single person out there, every human is an image bearer of God, which gives us all inherent God-given value. Every single one of you in here are fearfully and wonderfully made into the image of God. Which means because of that fact, nothing else, nothing that you've done, you have God-given inherent value. We all are imperfect image bearers, yes. We all sin, yes. But because we have the image of God in our lives, we have that value. But the truth of our spiritual deadness means we fit descriptions like this one in Romans 1. Romans 1 verse 23 or verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling being mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And then verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Due to our sinful nature, that we have, we, have, we have been darkened in our thinking. And what that means is we have exchanged the glory of the creator. We have exchanged the glory of God, the one who spoke everything into existence, all powerful, all wise, majestic and holy, the one who gives all life, the one who has made everything, the all satisfying, all fulfilling one. We have exchanged this God for a lie. We have exchanged who he is for the lie that the things of this world will fill us, that the things of this world will satisfy us. The Bible calls it a lie because it is. The desires of our flesh are contrary to God. And we have exchanged the only one that can bring us fulfillment for things that only leave us empty. We've exchanged it for our own desires. And look at those descriptions back in Ephesians 2, right? Following the course of this world. Following what this world is doing. Following the prince of the power of the air. Living in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body. We are so consumed by sin so consumed by it that we crave these things that cannot satisfy. And I saw a quote by C.S. Lewis that I think summed it up perfectly. He said this, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And this is the part of the question that I want us all to hear. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. 
We exchange what God can give us. The, the pleasures forevermore, right? In your presence is, is infinite joy. We exchange it for things that cannot satisfy us. And so it is important, it is essential that we understand this identity that we all have. We must be honest with ourselves. We must realize this, that this is who we are apart from God. And the reason we must understand this is because the beauty of it for me, the beauty of it for you, the beauty of it for all of us is that our story doesn't end here. The beauty of understanding that this is our, our, our identity apart from God is that it doesn't end there. That may be bad news, but we gotta go through the bad news to get to the good news. And we get to it here, continuing in Ephesians chapter two, going back in verse four. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If you don't hear anything else tonight, hear these words, but God. If you don't leave, with, leave here with anything else tonight, leave here with these two words, but God. No matter who you are, what you've done, how much of a wreck you think you've made in your life, who you've hurt, what bridges you've burned, this is the good news for you. And if anything is going to change in your life, it's going to start with these two words, but God. But God is how we get our new identity. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together in Christ. We once deserved an eternal punishment, but God was rich in mercy. We once were unlovable. We once were undesirable. We once were unwelcomable. We once were enemies of God, but God with the great love with which he loved us, sent his only son. And this isn't something that was just written down and we say it and we think, oh, it's so great, right? Ah, God's awesome. God showed us this love. God showed us what but God means. As we read in John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what this means. That Jesus, being sent to this earth, lived the perfect life that we couldn't live and took the place of all of us in this room, took the punishment that you were supposed to take, took everything upon himself on the cross and was, was killed, died, and was buried and rose again three days later. And what's so amazing about that is now, right, now we have hope. We once were chained to this sin. We are chained to this, to this sin with no hope, but God gave us the power to become more than conquerors. Romans 8, 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? What does it mean to do more than overcome your sin? It means to now take that sin and use it for the purposes of God. Now you take what you've been through and you go to your friend that's struggling with that sin. Now you take what you've been through and you go and you help other people that are dealing with addiction. You go and you use that sin for God's purposes because he gives us the power to become more than conquerors. This is what we have been called to. By grace, you have been saved. The way we get this identity is receiving something that none of us deserve. No pastor on staff, no table leader, no one sitting in here deserves this. But God shows us this grace. But God sent his son to this earth. 
He showed his love for us in the most ultimate way. Not by saying, I just forgive you, we just move on. But by taking your place on the cross. So now, what we do with this, we have this new identity. We know where we once came from. We know that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And it's only by grace It's only by what Jesus did for us on the cross, bowing to him in surrender and putting our faith in him that we can now be saved to get this new identity. Now that we have this new identity, now we must go on and live in it. Now we must go on and live as Jesus has called us to live. And I'll be totally honest with you. This was the biggest struggle I had in my life. The biggest struggle I had in my life was truly believing and understanding this identity. Because what happened to me was that the chains of guilt, of shame, were so heavy on me. I felt that I didn't deserve this grace. I didn't deserve to be forgiven and follow God. But what needed to happen was I needed to believe it. I needed to know that I didn't deserve it. It's just about God loving me so much. And because of this struggle, I fell into this verse of Proverbs 26, 11, where it says this, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Have you ever seen that before? You ever seen a dog do that? You're just going, what are you thinking? Right, he does that weird, like what's going on? He throws up and two seconds later he walks away and he's like, I'm gonna go out and eat it, right? And you're thinking in your head, what is going on? What is this dog thinking? That it just came out, you just threw that up and you're gonna go and eat it? But this is what we're like. This is what we're like when we return back to that sin. That sin that chains us. That separates us from God. That brings shame. That brings guilt. That brings death. That's what it's like when we go back to the sin. We have God who can provide us infinite joy, infinite fulfillment. Yet we go back to that sin. Now that we have this new identity, we have been forgiven, what are you going to do to not go back to that sin that once weighed you down? What are you going to do to stay out of this Proverbs 26, 11 verse? How are you not going to return to your folly? I mean, let's be real practical here. What do you have to do in your life? You gotta stop driving past that liquor store? Is it your friends or who you think are your friends you gotta stop hanging out with? That's what it was for me. I knew anytime I was with this group of friends, we were partying and we were doing doing things that we shouldn't have. And I knew I needed to get away from them. Because what they were doing was not helping me. They didn't love me. And instead, they were just bringing more ruin to my life. What about, what about the dealer's number that's still on your phone? You got to delete it? Get rid of the contact? Don't even let the temptation sit there. Don't even let the option be there. Just cut it out of your life, right? We have to kill this sin, Because what happens is the sin that we return to, the folly that we return to is fleeting. The pleasures are fleeting. And we see it all around us, right? What does this sin do to us? It brings ruin, destruction, and death. So as we wrap up then, my my question becomes this. Is this your new identity? Is this your new identity? You hear these words about being dead in our trespasses and sins. And I know that feeling when the Holy Spirit starts to convict us. Right? You start to think, I've I've done so much wrong in my life. I know what I deserve. If you're in that place, I'm telling you, grace is found here. Hope is found here. But God can change your life forever. You can be forgiven of everything, of every guilt, of all the punishment before God. You can be made new. And a new life for you can start today. 
Tonight it can start. Forgiveness, redemption, restoration, whatever it is, the Lord can bring it tonight. And if that is you, are you living in it? Are you living in this truth? Are you living in this new identity? Are you living in this grace that God has shown us? What are you doing to stop repeating the folly? What are you doing to stop returning to the vomit? Do you have that accountability partner? And if we can be more real, do you have that accountability partner who's going to call you out on your crap? Do you have that leader? Do you have that friend who's gonna be real and honest with you and tell you when things are going wrong in your life and tell you the things that you need to kick out? Are you living in that? What do you need to do to cut it out today? And if it's not you, if you hear me talk about these verses, hear me talk about this new identity, if it's not you, you're sitting here, you think, I've never done this. I've never surrendered to the Lord. And the simple question I'll ask you is this, what is holding you back? What, what sin's keeping you back? What person, what thing in your life is keeping you back? Because I promise you, I promise you the Lord is better than anything else in your life. The Lord is better than anything else that can keep you from him. If you think you're gonna miss out on joy, I promise you, you'll get way more. If you think you're gonna miss out on happiness, I promise you the Lord has, has infinite joy. You will be totally satisfied and fulfilled in the Lord if you come to him. Tonight, everything could change for you. Your story could begin a new trajectory. And as I started thinking about this sermon, I I saw this quote, and I think will wrap us up so great here. It's like Charles Fuller, who's a famous evangelist, and while he was on the road, he's he's a traveling evangelist, he was writing a letter to his wife, And this is what he said in one of those letters. He said, there has been a complete change in my life. Sunday, I went up to Los Angeles and heard Paul Rader preach. I have never heard such a sermon in my life. Ephesians 1.18. Now my whole life and aims and ambition are changed. I feel now that I want to serve God if he can use me instead of making the goal of life the making of money. And at that last part, just just insert whatever your struggle is. Instead of making the goal of your life, fulfilling the desires of our flesh, everything can change tonight and you can now live for the Lord. Instead of making the aim of your life, partying, being with that group of people and being in things you know you shouldn't have, the goal of your life could be total fulfillment in the Lord. But I'll say this tonight. If anything is going to change, if this grace is going to be shown to you, if your life's going to change tonight, it's going to start with these two words. But God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the grace and mercy that you've shown us when we didn't deserve it, that you came down to this earth, that you lived for us, that you died for us, that you rose again so that whoever would come to you, that whoever would believe in you shall not perish but have everlasting life. I pray for everyone in here who's struggling, Lord. I pray that you would lead them to you. Lead them to finding hope redemption, restoration in you. I pray that through your spirit, you would give them the boldness and the confidence to do that tonight. Lord, we love you. We pray this all in the very precious name of Jesus. Amen.